already. So here we are once again, um, ready to get started on the last class for this um for this week. So yeah, hopefully you know everything is going to work great, and we're gonna be able um to fulfill all the activities that we have planned for this evening. Now, in the meantime, of course, I um I hope that you know participants start to log in because in that way, of course, we're gonna be able to um complete the different activities and um, simply go ahead and uh yeah to oh here we go. Hi, hello, hello, good evening and welcome. Welcome to um to the last lesson of this week. I hope you are having a great time and uh, you know tonight we can get to go ahead and practice as much as possible, get to learn something more and enjoy our time here um, during the class. Now, for this evening, there are a few things that we are supposed to be working on. And some of those things are going to be talking about models, which was, you know, the activity that we had uh, um, a little bit pending since yesterday. Um, so yeah, we're going to be talking about model verbs and the level of obligation that you have depending on what model verb you use, when of course the topic is talking about that, talking about obligations or um, duties that we may have. So that's one part. Then we also have um, a conversation to practice, which is basically an an idea, you know, a situation that someone can get to face. It's not that that possible, but still, it's something that, you know, one time in life, maybe we can get to face a situation similar to this one. And then we have also unreal conditional sentences. Uh, when we talk about unreal conditional sentences, of course, we are referring to things that are not um, concrete, that are not um, necessarily possible in a huge way, but they can turn to be possible depending on the situations. So yeah, those are like the main things that we're going to cover and the main you know topics that we're going to follow up for this evening. Now, as it is the last class of the week, I have one question that I normally ask on this day that I think I haven't been able to ask um, to you guys because we have had, you know, Friday classes on the two previous weeks. And uh, there has been a very, very tiny amount of participants being part of the class, which of course means that, you know, it will not necessarily help. Like, I'd rather go ahead and practice different things or do other activities when I only have one or two people than, you know, go ahead and, and, and uh, have that interaction. But tonight, I want to go ahead and do it because, yeah, I want to get to hear what are your answers to said question. And the question is relatively simple. All I want to know is if you have any plans for this weekend. So what are your plans for the weekend? That's basically it. That's the question for this evening. So let's get to hear maybe from Karen first. So in your case, Karen, do you have any special plans for this coming weekend? Um, hello, good evening. Good evening. And uh, yes, I I do. Um, well, on Saturday, I'm planning to go to a birthday party. My sister from Washington is coming with her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. So she's going to celebrate like a, a um, surprise party for him oh, so he's well he's i'm not sure how to say it but he's american but she's not white she's dark color okay yeah and he only speaks english so um i'm gonna i'm gonna go to the party with my mother to see my sister in uh, her boyfriend in the afternoon and in the morning I'm planning to buy something for him, um, a present. Uh -huh. And um, Sunday, normally I go to church in the morning. And uh, afternoon, I just stay at home. Oh, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that sounds great. You know, sounds like a, like a great plan to follow and something nice to do for the weekend. So surprise parties, they can go 
both ways. They can be amazing and sometimes they can be, you know, a mistake. Because, <laughs> yeah, there are people who sometimes they don't like the way the party goes, but hopefully for you, it's going to work amazingly and you're going to have, you know, the chance to spend the time of your weekend there, you know, having yeah. the best time possible. Now, um, the thing that you were mentioning, how to refer to people that are not necessarily light-skinned or white-skinned, I think that one way they do refer to this sort of people is like brown skinned, you know, it's not, brown? Necessarily, yeah, mm -hmm. brown skinned, not necessarily, um, you know, dark nor white. Because mm -hmm. uh, I was, I was, I don't know why I had this word in my mind, which was, which was Caucasian, but a Caucasian person is normally white, you know, someone like mm -hmm. an European white sort of person. Yeah, because normally the people say American, but I think that all of us, Americans, so American. this is not yeah. a, a correct word mm -hmm. yeah. to say, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why better, it's better sometimes, you know, to to simply say, I think that those two um, adjectives are not, like, decremental to anyone and not necessarily racist, you know, to say white or, as I said previously, light-skinned, you know, that's, mm -hmm. a, like, a new way of saying it, light-skinned and dark-skinned. Instead of mm -hmm. saying white and black, as people mm -hmm. used to say before. And now, of course, they also have the version of brown. Brown basically is for, like, you know, people like me that I do not necessarily fall into the black category. Mm -hmm. And um, Indian people as well. Of course, most Latin Americans mm -hmm. uh, fall into that category. So, yeah, that's why or how brown has become a common um mm -hmm. term you know to to describe people or at least i wanted to mention because i like to speak with him mm -hmm. with um my my sister's uh, friends mm -hmm. because her accent is different than my boss my boss is is um white mm -hmm. so yeah uh, so their pronunciation is well is is very is better it, pronunciation is is different than uh my sister's boyfriend mm -hmm. they speak like without any pass and sometimes where, it's a little bit difficult where is your boss from you it's from the united states my no boss like, like do you know that the, like the region where he is a new jersey new jersey oh okay well, i have a lot of them and i spoke with some people well a lot of people in united states there are some in new jersey um there are some in california new york yeah well the okay. company is in united states so uh -huh. we had to speak with um a variation of people yes different even regions. people from uk sometimes we have meetings with people from uk that is difficult <laughs> and uh, many people from india uh -huh. and, um yeah from india mm -hmm. technology is made for it in yeah. India and in India. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a lot of accents. So have you noticed the difference between people who live in like the um the Easter coast and people from the West Coast? Like people from California. In the United States? Yeah. You said that you live, you know, you talked with people from California. Have you noticed yeah. any difference between those two people, like your boss and the people from Cali? Or you haven't paid attention no. to that? No. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. So there is a huge difference. Like in terms of um accents they have very different accents um for example if i don't know if you have any co-workers or any you know person that you deal with who is from texas people from texas are probably the hardest to understand or the hardest to follow um mostly when uh, let's say that they are very used to like having meetings only with people who speak english as the first language and they mm -hmm. come to this meeting they do not consider the fact that you are not a native. They simply come into the meeting and they start bustling everything they have, like, you know, giving all the information as fast as possible. And Texans are very complicated to understand or to follow when they are having those sort of conversations. Um, I had the, the experience of doing a layover in Texas. The first time I was in the US, I had to stop uh, at the airport in Houston. And I remember I went to the bathroom and I heard this guy on the phone. Like I, I saw he was on the phone. Um, I was nervous. So I went into the toilet, you know, I didn't go to like mm -hmm. the, the urinator. Um, but I was 
listening to his conversation or trying to listen to the conversation. And he was like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, I'll be there at that time. And I was like, what? <laughs> Honestly, I was like sitting on the toilet, you know, trying to pee. And I was like, what am I doing here? <laughs> like I, I wasn't able to understand a single piece yeah. of what he said um, because they have such a strong accent. And I don't know, they say that, you know, they sound like Mexicans. That's what they say, that they sound like Mexicans because they used to be Mexicans, mm -hmm. but they do not. They do not. They sound like people from a ranch, honestly. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. It's, that people you know, from that time, uh, well, that is specific states, like uh, people who has a uh, forms and things like that. Yeah, they are very, very hard to understand. People, yeah, like people yeah. from Kansas, people from um exactly. Iowa. Yeah, I I worked for a call center for like two months. It wasn't like a long time, but I heard you know I was working for AT and T, so I was getting calls mm. from basically all over the. Mm. Teleperformance. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You see why I only lasted two months. Uh, well, I, I just heard. I never work in a teleperformance. It just a, a, in Sykes. Yeah, they Sykes, they say that Sykes is a great uh it's a great um you know um call center. So yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I actually right now my sister she just got a job at Telus, so she's gonna start training on Monday, so that's great, you know. Uh but yeah, it's gonna be chat so it's not gonna be that hard i think anyway the thing is that um i was able to hear even more accents and i was able to like see where the people are actually calling from and the thing for about people from california is that they have this mixture i don't know if you have or if you have a, that idea or if you do that but many people in california they know spanish even though they don't use the spanish to communicate it's like even people Asian people know Spanish. And uh, I learned this by heart because I was able to go and visit some family there um, during my, my time in the U.S. And uh, I have one cousin who doesn't speak a word in English. He has lived in the U.S. for almost 40 years now, but he doesn't say anything in English. So I remember he used to wake me up around 5 a.m. and like, you know, tell me, let's go get a coffee. So we went to this store. It was just around the corner. And the owner was Chinese lady. Um, when I got there, you know, I was almost always like telling her, can I please have this? Can I please have that? Can I please have another sugar? Um, he was only like, me da un café como siempre. <laughs> and she got it. And, and the, the thing is that she doesn't even speak English. Yeah. So mm -hmm. she doesn't speak English. She only, I, I only heard it speak Chinese. And I, I don't, I'm not inventing that because my cousin's uh, son he does speak English and he told me once that yeah the lady doesn't know English so she understands what she needs she to understand. tell and mm -hmm. she also understands Spanish and the same goes for almost every and he said it like this the same goes for almost every gringo that you see around here they are all going to understand like if you say anything in Spanish they're going to understand however yeah. they're not going to be able to reply and the yeah. other thing is that people from Cali are normally going to sound you know like 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 yes yeah. one of the managers uh I, I'm, I don't know if she is from New Jersey as well or from California but her accent is like um the girls in in the movie mean girls mm -hmm. it's like totally girly like oh it's my god hard for me. Yeah. you're doing such an yeah. amazing job it's hard for me to so, yeah, understand they, her yeah. they, they made uh, the vowels go a little bit longer so they sound like that they sound so i think overreacted like their language or their, their english is overreacted so yeah, yeah it's it's kind of hard um the difference between people from the new york city like if you know your um how can we call it like your brother-in-law or you know your sister's boyfriend maybe if he is actually from new york they have this thing that um there is a huge mixture of cultures in new york and uh, they also have a little bit of italian mixed in there because there mm -hmm. are many many italians living in new york mm -hmm. so they say that people from chicago and people from new york 
speak in a faster way because Italian is a language that is supposed to be a little bit fast. Mm -hmm. so that's what makes them harder to, to follow. Yeah. And of course, people in New Jersey are more um, like into business. They relate more to people. They have mm -hmm. more conversations that are like in offices and people mm -hmm. in New York have more conversations like on their streets. So yeah. it's going to be like more informal than people yeah. in New Jersey. So yeah, there is, there is a, there are long videos about that on YouTube. Like you can, you know, see the differences and establish the differences. Um, for example, something that I did get from the, the state where I was living is that I sometimes tend to swallow some, some letters. Like for example, when you say mountain, you know, that's what, how most people say it. In my case, I say mountain. I feel way better if I say it like that. I feel way mm -hmm. more comfortable to say mountain than saying mountain. Most people will pronounce the T, I swallow the T. Um, and there are other other words like that. Um, but yeah, I kind of grew, you know, um, used to that. And uh, it that makes the difference. There is a, a little bit of a difference there. So yeah, it's like every state has its own thing. Um, so yeah, I don't know. A, one region that I don't know how people uh, actually speak is people from Miami. I haven't actually been related to anyone from Miami. I heard that people in Miami doesn't speak English. That is true. I heard some uh, sometime in 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 the TV that they just speak Spanish because Spanish. mostly um the people who lives there is from uh, Cuba. Cuba, Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. and yeah. Venezuela, Colombia. So yeah, mm -hmm. those are like the main communities in Miami. Yeah. So, but mm -hmm. still, you know, it's, it's great to know, like how people are going to say some things, or it's great to know a little bit of the background or like where the people come from, because that way you're going to have the ability to like focus on like what things, you know, to expect, like, you know, that you're going to be having to listen to longer vowels if you're talking to someone from Cali, because that's basically a staple. People from mm -hmm. Cali are almost always going to, you know, have that longer uh, vowelization as they refer to it so yeah it's it's tricky but it's cool you know it and is. then and then of it course is. there is always english people you know people from england <laughs> yeah i know they yeah. are they're <laughs> special. yeah i love the accent though but yeah they are very hard to follow very hard but, yeah. yeah okay so um thank you <laughs> let's move on let's see how about in the case of uh, rodrigo mendoza how about you rodrigo uh do you have any plans for this coming weekend um, in my case, teacher, I don't have a plans uh, for the next weekend, uh, but I prefer, for example, the Saturdays, I prefer get up uh, late because in the in the weekdays, uh, I get up, uh, for example, the 5 a.m. o'clock, and I prefer get up uh, late the every Saturday. Um, for example, the Sunday, uh, I'm going to go with my girlfriend uh, uh, restaurants. I prefer go mountain restaurants uh, because it's, it's, it's more, it's, it's, it's a long, for example. Yeah, and it's also uh, refreshing. Yes, yes. And, but I don't, I don't, I don't make a, much activities, uh, but every weekend I prefer stay in my in my house, and I usually going to go at the park or do exercise, for, for example, in the in the afternoon. Uh, but I enjoy only rest in my house, teacher. Okay, that's great. You know, sometimes having a plan. Have, not having a plan is the best plan because um, you can simply follow uh, whatever comes your way. Like you, know, you can do anything that you want because you're not necessarily attached to any specific thing. So yeah, sometimes that's even better, you know, than actually following uh, an agenda. So pretty cool. Great. How about in the case of Rodrigo Hernandez? In your case, Rodrigo, do you happen to have any special plans for this coming weekend? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Hello there. Good night. In my in my case, I I will 
Tu. Eh, una vez eran with my wife and my dad. Mm -hmm. eh, eh, no, in Plata Mundo. Oh, cool. um, yes. Y on the regular of uh, I will up in the in the week in the weekend is for example uh, buy in a in the market on the supermarket uh, cleaning the house mm -hmm. uh, um, okay great yeah uh now i don't know if you guys are you know part of the rich part of the country that is still buying tomatoes because yeah in my house we still have a lot of tomatoes that we bought last week um and right now we are treating those tomatoes as if, as if it was caviar you know like we're using tomatoes only with things that actually uh mean a lot to us so yeah and uh yes So yeah, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, tomatoes nowadays are basically like you know adding gold to your food. So it's they're expensive, or that's what they're they're saying. You know that tomatoes are going to be very expensive for a while. So yeah, uh, I highly recommend you that you know if you can just get some naturas instead of tomatoes. <laughs> I don't know. I was just thinking of of plans earlier today. I was working and also thinking on like. What am I going to do this weekend, you know, when I go to the market? Because um, I don't want to necessarily face the fact that they're actually that expensive. But they say they are. And uh, yeah, it's it's part of what we got to do. So hopefully also in your case, you have a great time, you know, with your family when you go to eat with them, as you said. And, uh, you know, you can find some great deals when it comes to um, getting your um Your, your food from the supermarket. So now, uh, I think that we're going to go ahead and start talking about these things that we have over here, which are the modal verbs. I think modal verbs are easy. Like we have, you know, learned about them for quite a while and they're not that complicated to follow. Modal verbs are normally, you know, these words that we use when we're talking about, um, well, Things like obligations, things like abilities, or things like um, necessities to some extent. Uh, yesterday, I also mentioned that we can, uh, at the same time, use adverbs that, of course, what we are going to be referring to with these adverbs is the amount of obligation that you have to do something. So, in the case that you use a model like might or may, What you're saying is that um, the amount of obligation that you have or that you're putting towards the person um, to whom you're telling this is around 60%. You know, it's like there is an obligation, yes, but it's not like you are fully um, like, you know, th that it's something you have to do. Like you, uh, if you don't do it, you may, I don't know, fall into um, a fine or something like that. It's simply... Like an agreement and um, a gentleman's gentleman's deal to some extent. So yeah, it's you know saying that you are going to do something, but you're not gonna die if you don't. Then uh, on the other hand, we have the adverbs, and the adverbs we can use are maybe or perhaps. These both mean something very similar. Maybe is something uh, as in, as if in Spanish we said quizás. And perhaps is as in Spanish we said tal vez. So they're similar on the way in which they, of course, represent once again like a sixty percent, you know, of certainty that um the activity that you're mentioning or anything that you're planning is going to be completed. So it's a sixty percent. It's not a full obligation. It's not full on on the person that you're telling this to, but still you are. Telling the person that because you're expecting them to comply or to complete the task that you're mentioning. So in the in the side of the models, you can use might or may. In the side of the adverbs, you can use maybe or perhaps. Then we also have could. So could is a little bit stronger 
than using might or may. Um, might, one thing that is important to, to highlight here is that might is a modal verb that we use, but we use it when the activities or the things that we're planning are not necessarily um, in our reach. Like, you know, it's not a decision that is left alone to us. It's something that depends on something else. Like, let's say, for example, um, you're telling your friend that if my dad allows it, I might go to the party. But you first need your dad's allowance. So if your dad doesn't allow you to go, it means you're not going to go. So it's only if the other thing is completed, then you can do it. Or for example, I will go, I might go if it doesn't rain. Like you're saying, you know, if it doesn't rain, it is possible that you will go. However, in May, it's more of my decision. It's a little bit more of my decision. Like, yeah, I may go or yeah, I, I may be there. And May is going to be, you know, mostly like not completely an agreement, not completely a obligation, but some to some extent, it's a, a little bit of a confirmation, but you're not necessarily saying, yes, I will be there. Now, in the case of could, could is a little bit more stronger. And with could, what you're saying is that, you know, the possibility is higher. So when you use could, um, you're talking about maybe a 70% obligation, 70 to 80% obligation. Because here is like, um, you are actually agreeing to do something. So um, let's say that I am asking you to bring, I don't know, two sodas for the party. And you say, yeah, I could do that. You know, I could do that. It can sound as if it's not, a strongly uh, an agreement or a, a full on obligation. But when you say could, it's like, yeah, sure, trust it on me. You know, I will be able to do it. Basically, that's what you understand. Even though the sentence sounds more friendly and sounds um, less complicated than that, what you're saying in the end is basically that, that you are under agreement and that you are also going to comply with that request. Then you have on the side of the adverbs, possibly and probably. Now, possibly and probably, the same thing. It's a 70 to 80% agreement. It's a 70 to 80% um, a statement or confirmation that you are going to do something. So it's like, um, yeah, I will po possibly show up at your party. You know, it's like, I don't have anything else to do. So possibly, you know, it, there's a high possibility that I will be there or probably same thing, you know, yeah, I will, I will probably be there. Or yeah, I can probably do that. You know, if somebody asks you like, hey, same question, right? Can you bring two sodas for the party? You say, yeah, I can probably do that. So saying probably do that, or I can probably do that, it will mean that you are actually agreeing to do in it. Uh, but, you know, you don't want to like necessarily say, yes, friend, I do feel the obligation with you to do this activity because you requested me. That is like too formal, right? So saying, yes, I could probably do that sounds more friendly, but it's also an agreement. Now, there is, of course, a still a chance. There is a still 20%, 20 to 25% that allows you not to complete the task. So when you use could, possibly or probably, it means that you, know, you are agreeing to do something, but you're not necessarily saying 100% yes, I will be there. Now... Or I will I will do that in case that you want someone to be fully on agreement on something that you're that you're offering or something that you're um, proposing this person, you need to ask them to reply with a must. Or in the case of a must, uh, you need to ask them, you know, to like basically promise it, because when you use must it's like a promise. So if someone says, yes, I must be at your party or you must expect me there or, um, you know, we must meet there. It means that you are 100 percent agreeing that you will go to this person's invitation or that you will accept this person's invitation. So it means that, you know, 100 percent, it's your responsibility to be there and your agreement to be there. Now, 
of course, in this case, I'm talking about a party. It sounds a little bit extreme talking about something like that. Maybe we can also change a little bit of the of the setting and probably mention something like a school. You know, if you are a child representative at a school, it means that you must be present at all parents' meetings. You must um, attend all the special meetings that the teacher may request. You must follow the process that the the, the kiddo is following or is um, you know through. So it's your obligation. So everything you say with must, it's something that you are um, obliged to do. And if you don't, well, you are failing to some agreement or in some cases you are failing to a law and that will get you into trouble. Of course, if, for example, you fail to a must that you have at your work, it can end in you getting fired, you know, simply being expelled from your from your job and your boss or uh, superior telling you that, you know, you failed to do this and now you can no longer work for them. So because you failed to one of your obligations, you failed to one of your musts. Now, that is in the case of the models. In case of using adverbs, it's basically the same level of agreement, the same level of compliance is expected when you use definitely. So if you tell someone, I will definitely um, finish the paper for Friday, That means that you will do that, that, you know, there is no chance you're not going to do it. So, yeah, it's like um, you are 100 percent sure that you're going to be able to to make it for Friday. So when you say something with definitely, it's, of course, something that you once again are obliged to do, are expected to complete completely, uh, even though it was redundant. But yeah, you are expected to fully do that thing. So yeah, definitely. Um, and that can also be an answer to something that someone asks you, you know, in terms of like um, your teacher tells you, oh, sorry, the teacher or, you know, your kid's teacher tells you to go to a meeting or ask you to go to a meeting. Then your answer can be, yes, I will definitely be there. So it means that you are, of course, agreeing with the responsibility and telling them that, you know, it's a hundred percent sure that you will do what you're expected to do or what you are demanded to do. So yeah, uh, there, there we have it then. Models and adverbs, might and may for things that are like, for things that, yeah, we have some room, like, yeah, sure, we can do it, but it's not like we are going to do it. Yeah. It's like, yeah, sure. If we want, we will do it that day. Same thing with maybe and perhaps, you know, it's like a possibility. It's up in the air. It's something that, sure, we can do. But, um, you know, if we feel like it, it's not like I am going to do it just because you say so. Uh, now, we could or possibly and probably. It's a bit different. It's like, OK, yes, I think I will do it. You know, it's like, sure, um, there is a high possibility that I will do it. So, yeah, possibly and, and probably. And the same goes with, for could. And for must and definitely, there is basically no other way around. It's like either you do it or you do it. You know, it's like, yes, you got to be there. You got to do this. It's like part of, you know, part of you now. So, yeah, it's something that um, you have to follow. You have to do it. So, yeah, that's for um, must and definitely. Now, any questions you may have regarding this topic? Um talking about models because right now we're going to go into some examples or like talking about more in depth you know and like when you can use or what other words or phrases you can use to express obligation um because something like this so as i said previously models are for permission obligation or prohibition and here we have some examples or on when or how we can use them for example we have for permission can can you use it when you're asking someone to do something. Uh, now, I just got to say something. When you use can, there is something problematic that, um, you know, has been basically mentioned in the last few years. This is a little bit old. This book is a bit old. So that means that this information is not necessarily met by the book. Uh, but 
uh, it has been discussed that nowadays it is better to use may when you're requesting permission because in may you are putting yourself in a humble position like you know you're not necessarily expressing your ability to do something it's more of as it is supposed to be a permission like may i do this may i do that um back in the day i remember that many teachers uh will teach students in english classes to ask uh, for permission as can i go to the bathroom and that has been shown to be more of an ability you know kids nowadays don't take that as a permission as an allowance they see it more as a possibility because can or ability sorry because can is a verb that we use to express exactly that when you are able to do something like if you can dance you can say it like that i can dance you know so going to the bathroom is something that people can do and when they say can i go to the bathroom they don't necessarily wait for approval because they're already telling the teacher you know like yes i can like it's 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 an ability that i have i can go to the bathroom so now more teachers are including me are starting to use the verb may instead of saying can i go to the bathroom it will be more educated to say may i go to the bathroom because that is of course asking for permission as if you were asking i don't know your parents you know to do something like may i go to this party may i um have a candy or any other thing that will require you to ask or to get permission from your parents is better if you teach you know people from now on to ask it with may like instead of saying can i interrupt because when you say it like that once again it sounds as a as a as something that you are authorizing yourself to do you know can i interrupt it means like you have that ability to interrupt but if you say may i interrupt that is a bit different may i interrupt will be understood as you know you going ahead and asking for a space to cause a little bit of an interruption because you want to say something so may i interrupt it's way better than saying can i interrupt and uh, then we have allowed to allowed to is of course same thing or, well, here maybe we should change a little bit of this and say, be allowed to. Be allowed to. Because that's basically how it is, you know. Um, when you are allowed to do something, it's when somebody else gives you the permission to do that thing. So it would be something like you asking, I don't know, a superior at your job, um, maybe saying, am I allowed to take coffee from the machine? You know, it's like, asking them if it's part of your um what you call it um sort of like uh, your permissions or your allowances in the company like am i allowed to to get some coffee because you don't know maybe they're saving the coffee for um only clients maybe it can be you know they have the coffee merely for clients and not for um for employees so it's better to go ahead and ask like that. Uh, now, of course, that's something a little bit too extreme. There are other things that you can ask for. And these are more like questions when you um, will say, am I allowed to go early or to leave early today? It's because, well, you see that maybe the work is going slow and you just feel like you have to do something at home or you feel like going home. So you can go ahead and ask that. Am I am I allowed to to leave early today? Like, yeah, can I please leave early? It's basically the same thing. Now, with obligation. Obligation, of course, here we can mention um must as the highest obligation, but right now we're not going to do it. We're going to talk about have to and got to. So, importante, estos eh Normalmente se van a decir como hara y gara. Sí. That's the way people pronounce it. Hara and gara. Like instead of saying have to or and got to or hagatu, people say hara and gara. Um, when do we use them? When we are talking about things that we need to complete. Like if uh, there is a meeting at your kid's school and you have to be there, so you can say, sorry, I gotta go. Um, I have to be at my teacher, I mean, at, at my kids' um, meeting. Or, as I said previously, you know, 
um yeah i had her i had her be at my at my um kids meeting so yeah hara that's how people normally pronounce this um or in a different way it's uh for example if you're gossiping about the obligations that someone has at your at your work you may say um if i had to do what he's doing right now i will do it this way you know if i had that obligation if i had to do what he's doing right now i will do it this or that or the way and have got to it's basically the same thing now with have got to the only difference is that um you are putting like more like emphasis on the activity that you need to perform. Like I've got to go to the bathroom, let's say, or I've got to um go to my, once again, same example, I've got to go to my kids meeting today, or I've got to go to my church meeting, or I got to go to my, um I don't know, my, my, doctor appointment so it's an obligation it's something that you have to do you have to complete and like there is no other way around it you know it's either you do it or you do it so you have to say i've got a or um i had a so those are like the two ways um gotta and hara of course you can also get to hear people who say i have to i got to it's not going to be weird but um, just so you know, whenever you hear people say I had a or I got a, it's going to mean that they had an obligation to do something. And then we also have prohibitions. With prohibitions, we have can't, which is this, a straight up prohibition for everything. It's like simply saying you can't drink anything in here. That means that, you know, you're not allowed to do that. It's prohibited to do that. So, yeah, you can't. Um, drive a car when you're drunk so that's another thing you know it's a prohibition of course it's something that people should not do in any case um or what else maybe saying um you can't listen to loud music when you're at your office you know that's another prohibition so yeah you can listen to music but not in a loud way so you have to keep it low so all prohibitions all rules or counter rules are going to be expressed normally with can't. Allowed to or aren't allowed to is um, normally used in public places. You know, can't is more for like private spaces or like, you know, your house, your office or something that you are like part of a community, but allowed to or aren't allowed to is going to be used more in like the public areas. Um, Let's say that in a park, you aren't allowed to ride your bicycle over the grass, you know, or you aren't allowed to have picnics and in a specific park. Um, so aren't allowed to is going to be more directed towards people with more respect instead of um, simply saying can't, because can't sounds more like like an obligation, a prohibition, like right on your face. But aren't allowed to is more like, you know, an explanation telling them like, yeah, you're not supposed to do that. You cannot do that because of this and this and that reason. So aren't allowed to, as I said, sounds more friendly to some extent, but it's still being a prohibition. Now, um, for this, for this, I do want you guys to write examples. So if we can take, I don't know, uh, it's 844. So let's take three minutes to write one example for each okay so one minute for example i want to hear one example for permission one example for obligation and one example for um prohibition so those are that's going to be the thing that we're going to work on right now so three minutes starting now to write down three examples um or three sentences you know that will serve as examples for these categories so yeah permission obligation and prohibition i will see you guys in a bit i will go ahead and get some water
Okay, so I think we do already have some examples. Uh, I got one here from Evelyn, which I am going to proceed to read right now. Uh, and we have the first one. May I go to the party tomorrow? Great. You follow the idea, you know. Um, instead of... Sorry, my bad. Instead of saying, can I go to the party? Which is like the basic idea, the first idea that we get sometimes. Uh, saying, may I go to the party? You So yeah, may I go to the party tomorrow? Sounds very, very compliant with, you know, the idea of asking for permission. Now the next one. I have to go because I will cook the meat. Um, this one is a great example. The only thing is the spelling for the last word. It is supposed to be like this, meat. So yeah, but the rest is great. So I have to go, uh, or you say, I got to go. You know, I got to go because I will cook the meat. Now, here, déjeme decirle, si fuese, por ejemplo, una conversación regular, ¿verdad? En Estados Unidos es muy probable que esto sonara, I've got to go because I'll, I'll cook the meat. Sí, así básicamente. I got to go because I'll cook the meat. Instead of saying, I have to go because I will cook the meat, um, it could sound something like that. You know, I got to go because I'll um, cook the meat. But yeah, meat, that's the only thing. And then we have, no, you can't. Now, for that one, I would have loved if I had more uh, background for the sentence. But still, it is a great sentence. You know, simply saying, no, you can't, is straight out to the point. It's straight out telling the person, no, it's impossible. No, you are not supposed to do that. It is a prohibition that you have. You know, you cannot do it. So, yeah, no, you can't. Um, what can it be? Probably your kid asking you, hey, can I, can I get a dollar? And you say, no, you can't. So that means, you know, it's a prohibition. So yeah, very, very good. How about, um, in the case of Rodrigo, Rodrigo Mendoza, do you have your examples already? Uh, okay, teacher. Uh, for example, in permission, uh, you can go with your friends to the party. Okay. Uh, you can go with your friends. Wait, dang it. With your friends to the party. Les metí bien la idea de la fiesta, va. Okay, yeah. so yeah. Uh, how about in obligation? In obligation, uh, I have to do the homework. I have to do the homework. Very good. How about for prohibition? And prohibition, I can't drink while driving. I can drink while driving. Okay, good. Now, there is one thing that I forgot to mention with this, because this one sounds, it can't sound tricky, okay? It can't sound tricky, because if you say like that, like that, if you're having a conversation with friends, and you say, I can't drink while driving, um, because of the verb can, because of the regular meaning for the verb can, it may sound as, as if you do not have the ability to drink and drive. So I think, I think um, something will, a little bit better will have to be taking away this while and saying, I can't drink if, I'm the one driving, you know, I can't drink if I'm the one driving, maybe, maybe like that, porque si yo digo, no puedo tomar mientras manejo, o sea, puede sonar como si no tengo la habilidad, ¿verdad? Como, o sea, si estoy hablando con amigos y, o sea, puede sonar a eso, aquí un amigo dijo, ah, sí, fíjate que yo, o sea, con, con el meñique agarro y aquí voy, pero, o sea, entonces, y, y tú puedes decir, no puedo tomar mientras manejo, así se puede entender por el significado del verbo can, sí, por eso nada más podría ser mejor cambiar un poco, verdad, de la de la construcción de la oración en saying I can't drink if I'm the one driving, um, or maybe I can't drink if I'm supposed to drive, or I can't drink if I'm the designated driver, anything like that, uh, but yeah, because if you say I can't drink if I'm driving, someone, no significa que no tiene sentido, sí lo tiene, pero pero también alguien puede malinterpretarlo como eso otro, ¿verdad? Entonces, a veces hay que ser cuidadosos con las interpretaciones que se les pueden dar a algunas oraciones, más que todo con estas que tienen palabritas así, o sea, que se prestan 
uh, a otras interpretaciones. So yeah, I can drink if I'm the one driving should sound much, much better. All right. How about we hear from, um, tell me, in your case, tell me, do you have your examples? Okay, seems like we're not getting in them right now. How about in the case of Ever? How about you, Ever? Do you have your examples? Okay, seems like not at the moment either. In the case of Rodrigo Hernandez, how about you, Rodrigo? Do you have your examples? Yes. Permission? Mm -hmm. You can go to play soccer with your friends. Okay. How about for obligation? Uh huh. You have to. Pay your bills. You have to pay your bills. Very good. And how yeah. about prohibition? You can. Mm -hmm. Play video games. Okay. You um, can. Night? At night. Mm -hmm. At night. Good. You can you can play video games at night. Muy bien. Y aquí esta palabrita, esto del final, nos deja claro que esta es una regla de prohibición. Porque lo mismo, ¿verdad? El problema es, es ese, la palabra can, sí, el verbo can. Que si yo digo, you can't play video games, puede sonar como si simplemente estoy negando la habilidad de esta persona para desarrollar esta otra actividad. Entonces... Por eso mismo a veces es importante cuando utilicemos la palabra can o can't en el caso de una negación aclarar el sentido de esta o aclarar a qué me refiero, digamos, de mejor manera. Aquí si yo digo you can't play video games at night, it will completely cover the fact that yes, it is a prohibition, it is something that you're not supposed to do, therefore, you know, there you have it. Now, here, if I, if I was the one saying this, I think I will have added this. You have got to pay your bills. Because if you say you have to pay your bills, um, it doesn't sound as an alarm. You know, I, I, I normally use you have to for things that are not necessarily uh, like strong obligations, more like, you know, something I have to do, something like I got going on and yeah, I, 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 I got to be there. Uh, but for bills, I think they are very important. And it's better if you say, You've got to pay your bills. You know, you've got to pay your bills. So, yeah, it's it's something you are um, obliged to do. You, 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 you have to go ahead and do it. So, yeah, you have got to pay your bills. Sounds much better than uh, simply saying you have to pay your bills. But still, it, um, they are all great examples. Now, how about in the case of Karen? How about you, Karen? I, I oh. Yes, yes, ever. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. You, uh, permission. Okay. You be allowed to use my car. Oh, great. You be allowed to use my car. Great. How about obligation? Uh, obligation, you have to assist the meet. Okay. I think like this okay how about provision obligation prohibition you can't it can be in the night okay you can't eat candy you know if más aquí para la noche siempre se utiliza el at sí at night you can't you eat candy at night great very good eh, para los periodos de tiempo que se refieren a eh, los momentos en los cuales no hay luz solar se utiliza la preposición at. El in se utiliza simplemente eh, durante el día. Puede ser in the morning o in the afternoon. Pero para hablar, o in the evening incluso. Pero para hablar acerca de la noche, noche. Sí, y la madrugada. Se utiliza at. At night and at dawn. Ahora, 
Muy bien. You'll be allowed to use my car. I love this sentence. Sí. Se te permitirá utilizar mi carro o mi auto. You have to assist the meeting. Great. You have to assist the meeting. Uh, ahora, el único detalle aquí es que existe una pequeña diferencia entre la palabra assist y esta, attend. Sí. Um, en español entendemos asistir como estar presente. En cambio, um, atender como eh, prestar el servicio, ¿verdad? De, de, de atención a alguien. En inglés se utiliza al contrario. Assist es ayudar a alguien, ¿sí? Por ejemplo, en el caso de asistencias como en los deportes. Y attend es el hecho de estar presente en un lugar. Entonces, you have to attend the meeting sería el verbo más apropiado. Eh, al contrario de utilizar assist, ¿sí? Assist puede ser utilizado, como les digo, en el momento que ustedes ayudan a alguien más. And then we have, you can't eat candy at night. Very good. Those are great, great examples. Okay. Now, I think that, yeah. How about you, Karen? Do you have your examples ready? Yes, I do. Okay. okay. For permission, uh, may I eat more chicken? Okay. Um, how about obligation? Obligation, you have to clean your bedroom today. In your bedroom today. And how about provision? And provision, uh, they aren't allowed to come to work using shorts. Yeah, uh, wearing. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, the rest was straight. Okay. Uh, yeah, may I eat more chicken? That is a good sentence. Uh, you have got to clean or you have to clean your room today. That is, you know, an obligation. You are given a rule and you aren't or they aren't. Oh, it was they. They aren't allowed to come to work wearing shorts. Great. Very good. Now here, this one is the only one that doesn't sound as natural. Like if I wanted to make it more natural, I will have to say something like, um, may I... have some more of that chicken you know if if you want to make it sound like natural natural you can say something like that may i have some more of that chicken because when you say it like that it sounds as if you like the chicken like you know you want more of the chicken now if you say simply say um may i eat more chicken um That sounds as if you are a kid who has chicken for the first time and you're like begging for some chicken. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, the context make it, makes it sound a little bit different than if you said, you know, a longer phrase with more feeling, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the rest was very, very good. So, um, yeah, time is up and we basically are supposed to wrap it up here. So, guys. Thank you very much for, um, you know, being on the first regular week of classes that we had. And hopefully we are going to wrap it up great for next week as well. So have a really good night and I hope I'll see you Monday. So bye-bye for now. Thank you. Okay, you're very welcome and see ya.